I've been accused of not talking loud enough, so if you can't hear, uh, too bad. No, uh, <laughs> raise your hand and wave it around, and somebody will do something about it. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> Can you hear yet? Sorry. <laughs> Have you got it cranked as far as it can go? <laughs> okay. For those of you who are visiting today, uh, I want to point out to you that I'm not the regular preacher. You'll probably soon know why. But uh, our normal preacher is James Downing. And he's on vacation this week, as Craig mentioned. Um, so I want to urge you to come back again next Sunday and uh, hear James declare God's word to us. He is an excellent preacher. Another reason I'm urging you to come back next Sunday is based on a report I have received from our ushers this morning. I can see the word got out that I was preaching today. <laughs> and... Uh, they informed me that they felt like they were working on an airline today. And we got a picture there for you of what's happening. They're coming, people are coming in and asking for an exit row. <laughs> Poor deacons don't know what to do. And um, now I'm a, a bit afraid that those of you who are sitting up close to the front here, like Dan and Diane, uh, might have some other ideas. Uh, you know, Dan uh, took me to task last week about food and a potluck. Well, I'm, I'm worried that Dan is going to be saying this to people, if you'll take a look at this cartoon, please. go. If you can't read it, it says next Sunday, if an usher asks if we want to upgrade, a free upgrade, say no. <laughs> oh, Dan and Diane got upgraded today. So our topic this morning, if you look in the insert in your bulletin, is the wrath of God. Specifically, can we reconcile the wrath of God with the love of God? Let's pray together before we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you that your word is alive and active. And we ask now that you will use it to draw us to yourself and to strengthen our faithful obedience of you, the one and only true and living God. Amen. I think I'm going to mention something that I don't know if we've ever mentioned. It just now hit me. Uh, Roberto uh, translates live when James is preaching. He doesn't have to talk quite so fast when I'm preaching. But uh, Roberto is translating into Spanish. He is listening to what I say and translating to what I've just said. I don't know how he does it, but good job, Roberto. <laughs> He's hiding back in the office so we don't hear him speak. A central teaching of the Word of God, obviously, summarized by the Apostle John with three words, God is love. And it's true, of course, and as followers of Jesus, we take great comfort in this knowledge that our God is love. But the Word of God also reveals another aspect of our God that is called the wrath of God. And in today's world, uh, 
the concept of God being our judge and expressing wrath toward humans upsets our cultural sentiments a bit. The world in which we live finds this idea too intolerant. Indeed, it's not uncommon to find that many of our peers have rejected this concept uh, outright. They find it intellectually incompatible with their worldview. They see no way to reconcile the love of God and the anger or wrath of God. So I think maybe we live in a day where us humans like to view ourselves as the judge of God and his character rather than the other way around. So there are many people who intellectually object to Christianity because they cannot rationalize the love of God with the wrath of God. And that can have an effect on us Christians when we're thinking about sharing the good news with someone. Well, there's family, friends, acquaintances, whatever. And we may be a little backward about coming forward in regard to the wrath of God. So I want to help equip you this morning to be strongly confident concerning the wrath of God when you share the gospel. At this time, I would like to ask David Weed to come and read to you an amalgamation of some scriptures from the New Testament. I've asked him to read them without scripture reference, but these are some scriptures that mention the wrath of God in the New Testament. David? The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people. Because of our stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. For those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. God's wrath remains on them. Gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. These words show us that we should keep a close watch on our lives. What we do, what we think, and what we say. Thanks, David. Today, many people think of God's wrath as uh, something like this. Uh, he's in heaven watching you. And he's just waiting for you to commit a sin so that he can gleefully and with great joy come down on you with a ton of bricks, so to speak. I want to suggest to you that that is not a totally accurate understanding of God's wrath. This morning I want us to find the answer to three questions in the Word of God. First one, and you'll find this in your bulletin uh, insert with an outline. The first question is, what is 
the wrath of God. Secondly, when is this wrath revealed? And thirdly, how does the wrath of God relate to the love of God? Is it not true that most of us on an emotional and subjective level find the image of a loving, merciful God far more palatable than the image of a wrathful God? But if we take an honest and unflinching look at the word of God, we cannot avoid seeing the wrath of God as reality. Listen again to Romans chapter 1 verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed against, from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. So our first question in your outline there is, what exactly is the wrath of God? Now when we think of wrath in human terms, we usually think of someone who exhibits sudden and unaccountable displays of anger. They blow up. Perhaps someone who is irritable and self-centered, etc., But I want to contrast that with uh, what J.I. Packer wrote in the book Knowing God about God's wrath. This is what Dr. Packer wrote. God's wrath in the Bible is never capricious, self-indulgent, irritable, morally ignoble thing that human anger so often is. It is instead a right and necessary reaction to objective moral evil. A right and necessary reaction to objective moral evil. If you have read the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Rome, you may recall that in chapter 8 and verse 2, he mentions what he terms the law of sin and death. This law, of course, is directly related to God's wrath. And it was first revealed to Adam in the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? David reminded us of that earlier. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will surely die. What is the wrath of God? Well, God's wrath is his natural reaction to any moral or spiritual evil. It simply is who he is. If you're taking notes, I'm going to pause here a moment and let you have the time to write that down. God's wrath is his natural reaction to any moral or spiritual evil. By natural, we mean it is his nature because of who he is. Now, let's look at Romans 1.18 again. Wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So I think you can see here that our perfectly just creator demonstrates his relationship to the godlessness and wickedness, and by that I mean all moral and spiritual evil, of the very people he created in his image, the people who are to live for his glory. That's you and me. So the wrath of God from Genesis 2 is manifested in death, physical death, and of course, spiritual death as well. Anders Nygren, a Swedish Bible teacher, wrote, Uh, this summary of the nature of our creator. As long as God is God, 
He cannot behold with indifference that his creation is destroyed and his holy will trodden underfoot. Therefore, he meets sin with his mighty and annihilating reaction. He cannot behold with indifference that his creation is destroyed and his holy will trodden underfoot. We have an example of that just in everyday life. Uh, what do our governing authorities here in Josephine County do with a captured uh, and guilty criminal? Well, they bring him or her to justice, don't they? And uh, Paul in Romans uh, chapter 13 writes about this. He told the believers in Rome, he said in verse 4, the authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid. For they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. And I want to suggest to you that uh, this wrath of God that we're looking at today is the moral equivalent of what we know as the law of gravity. Now, gravity, that law is, is formally known as the law of universal gravitation. And gravity is defined as the attraction between two objects. They are attracted to each other. Every object in this world has mass and is therefore affected by gravity. Every single object. Gravity acts like a magnet. Uh, it just pulls things closer to each other. Like your body and the earth. What causes gravity is not really known. Well, I should say it's not really known by us. But it is known, of course, to our creator who made it. We haven't figured that out yet. If we drop something, gravity pulls it to the floor. In school, we learned that gravity uh, is what guides the motion of the moon in orbit around our Earth. We also learned that it guides the orbit of our Earth around the sun. As I speak here, gravity is keeping my feet planted on the floor. Your seat is planted in the chair you're sitting in because of gravity. Gravity guides the traje trajectory of every rocket that we've ever sent or will send in the future. And... Uh, Gravity literally holds the universe together. Otherwise, it would fly apart. On the surface of our Earth, gravity means that if something is dropped from 32 feet above the surface in one second, it will hit the ground. It's my understanding that uh, that speed doubles every 32 feet. So if you step off the roof of a skyscraper in San Francisco, uh, what will be your fate? Well, <laughs> you'll be a goner when you plunge back to the earth at such a speed. When you hit the street, you're finished. So why do I think that the wrath of God is the moral equivalent to the law of gravity? I think it's because of what happens regardless of the circumstances, gravity is a constant. And regardless of circumstances of a spiritual nature, 
The wrath of God is a constant. Whatever happens in this life or in the life to come, if you and I violate the moral law or principles of God, His wrath demands punishment. The wrath of God against our sin is just as certain and dependable as the law of gravity. In his letter to the church in Galatia, Paul said this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. If you plant corn in your garden, you get corn. If you plant sin in your life, punishment must be meted out. And that punishment is the wrath of God. You may or may not get that wrath in this life, but you will surely get it in the judgment that is coming. And so we can see that the wrath of God is evident in the cause and effect consequence of sin. Sin always has a consequence. Now, what we call natural laws, uh, when we break them, we always see suffering and ultimately death. What happens to the person who drinks too much alcohol? Well, headaches, liver disease, etc., ultimately death. That is a physical consequence, the wrath of God on sin. He told Adam and Eve, don't eat of this tree or you will surely die. So sin leads to consequences and suffering, sometimes immediately, sometimes delayed. But all of this is a revelation of our per perfectly just creator and his wrath against moral and spiritual evil. Now let's move on to the second question in your outline there. Just when is this wrath of God revealed? Well, the simple answer to this question is, it has been revealed in the past, it is being revealed right now, and it will be revealed in the future. In other words, the wrath of God is being revealed continuously. Remember Romans 1.18. We'll go back there again for a moment. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. The grammatical construction of that statement in the original Koine Greek in which it was written means that we understand it best with this translation. The wrath of God is continuously being revealed from heaven. And then, of course, as we look to the future, there is what the scriptures call a final wrath still to come. That will take place when Jesus comes again to this earth, not as the Savior, but as the judge. He will judge the world. For those of us who are united to Christ by faith, the Apostle Paul tells us in his letter to the church in Thessalonica that Jesus will rescue us from that coming wrath. In chapter 10, he describes it this way. Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. That's how he characterizes Jesus and his ministry to us. Now let's go on to our third and final question. How does the wrath of God relate to the love of God? Can we reconcile the wrath of God to the love of God? The answer is a resounding yes. Uh, it's a truly amazing thing. When I, I'm 
I'm going to speak of the cross, and when I mention the cross, uh, I mean I'm referring to the execution of Jesus by crucifixion. So the cross is a clear expression of the wrath of God against all the godlessness and wickedness of mankind. And yet, at that same moment, it is the greatest expression of God's love. This is where God's wrath and God's love meet. Why do I say that? Because our Father in Heaven purchased for us an escape from His wrath through offering up His sinless Son to take the wrath we deserve and if that had not taken place we would have absolutely no hope at all of escaping the wrath of God. It reminds me of when uh, Jesus uh, got after Peter. Uh, he mentioned that he was going to have to die, and Peter said, no way, I'm not going to let that happen. And uh, Jesus called Peter Satan. He said, get behind me, Satan. Because if Jesus didn't die, we have no hope. It is uh, true that God's wrath was purchased at a tremendous price, the punishment and death of His own sinless Son. I want to say that if you can't see the wrath of God at the cross, then you cannot understand the love of God. It's vital that we understand the wrath of God in understanding His love. I like to say that if you haven't heard the bad news, then the good news that Jesus is Savior is meaningless to you. You'll see a sign, Jesus saves. Well, the average unbeliever from what? Measles? No, we need to hear the bad news and then the good news is good news. We can comprehend it. The problem with our thinking in part is that in human experience, wrath and love normally exist in mutually exclusive compartments, shall we say. We think love drives wrath out and conversely, we think that wrath uh, drives love out. Normally, we do not think that a wrathful person is a loving person. But that's not the way it is with God. God's wrath is not a blind rage. He's not having a temper tantrum. However emotional his wrath may be, it is an entirely reasonable and willed response on his part to offenses against his holiness. And why do I say it is a reasonable response? Because that's who he is, perfectly holy, perfectly just. It's only reasonable that he punishes what is not, what is not acceptable to him. And we need to remember that in our case, God's love for us is not generated by our own loveliness, is it? <laughs> if we were lovely, we would need a Savior. I'm speaking here in spiritual terms, of course. Romans 5 makes this clear, in a, in a sense, you recall that that verse says that God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Meaning, He didn't wait till we got ourselves cleaned up and then He died for us. If we were cleaned up, we wouldn't need Him. So here's the reality. If we look at the cross, at the very moment His wrath was put on His Son, He was motivated by His love to offer an escape to us. 
There's nothing intrinsically impossible about wrath and love being directed toward the same individual or people at the same time, if you're God. God and his perfections must be wrathful against us, against our sin. We are his rebellious image bearers, aren't we? We have offended him. But because uh, one of his perfections is also love, he is also loving toward us who are rebellious image bearers. Why? Because that's just the way he is. He's God, we're not. He's judging us, we can't judge him. In fact, uh, it's interesting to note what Jesus said about judgment in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 22. He said, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. Jesus came to the earth the first time to be our Savior. At his next coming, he will be the judge. Jesus is the judge who is coming. And what a great comfort to those of us who are trusting in Christ to save us when we can know ahead of time that the very judge who will administer the wrath of God is our Savior. It's not what you know, it's who you know at that point, right? Paul uh, described Jesus as our rescuer in, in his, <coughs> excuse me, his letter to uh, the Thessalonians. He said he described Jesus as the one who rescues us from the coming wrath. I wonder if they washed that before James left. <laughs> I said a moment ago that crucifixion, the crucifixion of our Lord is the greatest revelation of God's wrath against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. If you don't comprehend the wrath of God, you cannot understand the love of God. Both Jesus and the Apostle John characterize humans as living under the wrath of God unless they are trusting in Christ Jesus to save them from God's wrath. Every person you and I know is under the wrath of God unless they have come to faith in Christ as their Savior. The Apostle John put it this way in uh, uh, the third chapter of his uh, Gospel, verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. The key word here, of course, is remains. Let's say you're out in the woods and a huge log or tree falls on you. You know, maybe it's six feet in diameter. You cannot move out from under it. You're out there by yourself. You are stuck as long as that log remains on top of you. Being under the wrath of God is mankind's natural condition. And we remain pinned under that heavy log until we place our faith in Christ. The Apostle Paul expressed this in another way to the church in Corinth, I mean, in Ephesus uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He said, as for you, these people he's writing to now are believers. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work 
and those who are disobedient. The character of this world is shaped by the fact that the wrath of God is continuously being deployed against sin. And every single person on the planet is under that judgment. Either we pay for our sin personally through death for eternity or we believe that Jesus took our punishment on himself and having received this punishment uh, that we deserve we can now because of his work experience the grace and mercy of the love of God we are all hell deserving sinners we need clemency but we do not deserve it that's why Romans chapter 6 verse 23 speaks of eternal life as being a gift we cannot create it we cannot deserve eternal life we can only receive it as a gift from our perfect God so Romans 6 23 says the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's wrath is not based on what we like or dislike. It's not based on what we understand or don't understand. It is simply something that God has in his character and nature. And he's revealing it to us through his word and in nature. And we are left to respond to him accordingly. And there are only two possible responses. We can turn from sin and accept this gift that is offered through faith in Christ and his sacrificial death in our place. Or we can be like the people in the time of Noah who having been warmed of the flood after a hundred years said, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, sure, there's a flood coming. You know. Well, it came. So uh, we can continue to ignore him, ignore his wrath, but uh, that future wrath that is to come will clear everything up. I want to conclude by taking you to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. Paul told the Christians in Thessalonica this good news. Because he's writing to Christians now and including himself. He says, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath but to receive salvation, that is, rescue from the wrath of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not yet trusting in Jesus and his sacrificial death to save you from your sin and the wrath that you deserve from God, I urge you to do so immediately. Those of us who are already believing, Trusting Jesus for our salvation should never forget nor stop appreciating what the Lord has done for us, how he has enabled us to escape the ultimate expression of God's wrath. Remember, do you want to understand the wrath of God? Look at the cross, where you can see the wrath of God against sin demonstrated do you want to see God's love look at the cross where you can see his love expressed as he gives grace and mercy to those who trust in the death of his son the cross is where God's wrath and God's love come together at the very same instant if you will it's an absolutely amazing thing God has done. So simple, yet so profound. And if you are sharing the gospel with unbelievers, don't hold back in sharing with them the wrath of God against sin. You may be scoffed at, you may be rejected, but Jesus also suggests that the ministry of the Spirit is to convict 
unbelievers of sin, of God's righteousness, and of the judgment that is to come. So our job is to get the word out, the bad news and the good news. It's God's job to give spiritual life. And I want you to remember this. If God has no wrath against sin, then you do not need a Savior. If God doesn't care about sin, who needs to be saved? And someone at the conclusion of the last service, uh, when we were outside talking, said to me, oh, it goes the other direction as well. Um, if you have a Savior, you don't need sin. You have been cleansed. You can walk in His light. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for your word by which you reveal yourself to us and show us what your nature is. We acknowledge the fact that our sin has consequences that result in suffering and bring your wrath into our lives even though we are your children. But we are grateful that as your children you discipline us because you love us and want us to be like your son. And Father, for any people present here today who at this very moment remain under your wrath, we ask that you would graciously draw them to yourself through faith in your son, that they might escape the wrath that is to come.